This is Tracy Drummond, Archivist for the Southern Labor Archives at Georgia State University Library. Today is May 23rd, 2018, and I am in Hazelwood, Missouri with Claude Barnes, who is a retiree of Machinist District Lodge 837, and we are here today uh, to interview for an oral history for the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers Oral History Project. I always uh, want to say to our interviewers, our interviewees, when we get started, uh, that you are aware that we will be sharing this interview and putting it online and making it available to um, researchers and students and other union members all over the world. So, um, welcome and thank you for agreeing uh, with very short notice to be interviewed for the project. Um, and and welcome. Um, yes, sir. I'm not going to stop it. <laughs> no. See what what I, what I understood that you want to know mm -hmm. how we got our district started. I do want to under I do want that, but I want to understand more too about how you got started. Or how I got started. Yeah. So where and when were you born? When was you born? Yeah. Uh, August 19, 1927. Okay, and where? For both the Arkansas. And did you live there a while as a, as a young man? Yeah. So what was it like growing up there? Uh, uh, it was, I just grew up like all kids. I lived on a farm and then we moved to Missouri probably uh, maybe 1935. And we've been in Sykeston ever since. Do you remember life on the farm? Lived on a farm, yeah. Yeah, but would you? What was life? Do you remember living there? Yeah. Was it at more agriculture or more animal? Or? We had we had animals. You know, we did the farming. We did the raising cotton and corn and all that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just a, just a, just a big farm, right? Was. Was your dad in charge of the farm? Yeah. Was it, were you raising things to sell or was it to sustain the family? Just the family and then, <coughs> and then he'd sell the cotton and corn at the, you know, and what, at the fall we got rid of it. Okay, yeah. okay. So but I had plenty of help. I had four brothers and three sisters that helped us all. Okay, yeah. okay. So what made your family want to move to St. Louis? You don't know? Different farm, I guess. I don't know. So you, well, we moved out of the hills into flatland. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you were still pretty young at the time. I was were, young. Were you school age? Were you going to school? School, yeah. What was school like? But the time I get to go over it was nice, but I didn't get to go over it much. I I worked all the time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And was that pretty much how it was for all your brothers, you and your brothers and sisters? Yeah. Well, they they went to school more than I did. Okay. Yeah. Were you the oldest? No. Next to the oldest boy, there's a boy one one two years older than me. Okay. Um. So how long were you on the farm? All my life, I guess, until in the fifties. Until the. Yeah. So even after you graduated high school, you. I didn't graduate high school. Okay. So you started working. For about ten years, I run I would run a bulldozer. Me and my brother-in-law clearing woods and all with bulldozers, you know. I did that for about 10 years until mm -hmm. I jumped to, to St. Louis to start America. I went to California first, stayed five years. How did you get to California? Why did I work out there? What? Well, did you, did you have any military experience? I had a brother who worked there and he, he got me a job and I went out there. And, okay. him, yeah. and what was that like? It just, you know, a job. It was inside building aircraft, yeah. Okay. And what kind of 
aircrafts were you building? Do you we remember? Were, they were little small airplanes. Little, we were uh, North American aircraft, what it was. We just made, you know, sort of small airplanes. So and not then, commercial? Uh, no. Okay. And then I, about the second year of there, I, they wanted to send me out the valley and I went across the street and worked for Douglas, the building the big jet airplanes. Okay. Yeah. And and what and they were they the, commer they commercial? Were commercial. Do you yeah. remember do you remember which planes they were building? Oh, they probably were building D C eight. Okay. And D C ten. Mhm. And then uh left there and came to Saint Louis and started building an F four. What brought you back to Saint Louis? My wife wanted to come home, Saxton. Okay, so when did you meet her? You met her before you went out. Yeah, oh, probably the 50s, I don't remember, maybe okay. longer than that. Okay. Yeah. So you come, and do you remember, was it about 1955 when you came back? When I came back, yeah. Okay, um, and you... Was that the time that Douglas and McDonald merged? No, that was just McDonald Douglas then. Okay. Yeah. They didn't merge with Douglas till oh twenty years later, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you came back to work for McDonald. McDonald. Okay. And was it work similar to the work that you had been doing in California? Similar, yeah. But it was F four. They were fighter aircraft. Yeah. As opposed to doing the same work, sheet metal. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And was it a closed shop? Yeah. So the everybody shop, everybody joined the union. If you didn't join the union, you couldn't work there. Had had you been in a union when you were out in California working? No. 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 Union. That was not a union plan. No union plan. So. What did you think about join the, joining the union? Since it was your first experience. Yeah, just yeah, everybody told me that benefits and all we got from that, and that's what I joined. Yeah. Okay. Well, when I went over to McDonald and Douglas, I, I had to join, which was wonderful. I did that. Okay. And then the second year, I made shop steward and stayed that till we got a new district. Then I went to BR then. Okay. Well, let's back up just a little. I went too far, okay. Back yeah, up. let's, I, I just, I, I want to, I feel like you came here already thinking about what you wanted to talk about, but I've got some other questions. So, you worked in the sheet metal, mm -hmm. and was District 9 broken down, were there different locals within the district? Yeah. And how big was District 9? Was it was it the St. Louis area or did it have a, a, a bigger reach? Well, District 9 was St. Louis area. Can't, no, they was Kansas City too. In Kansas City? Yeah. How far are we from Kansas City? Oh, 200 miles maybe. Okay. Yeah. Was it all aviation work that was covered by District 9? No, District 9 was... Uh, you know, aircraft a little bit, and a lot of job shops, you know, like auto automobile shops and all that. It was District 9. Okay. Yeah. And then, so within that district, they had uh, locals for each yeah. of the... Did they have several locals they for McDonald? Locals, yeah. For um, For McDonald, like right. the one workplace had several yeah. locals. Depend Was it depending on the type of work that was done? No. No? No. They were... Their local lodge, most of their local lodges were strictly uh, commercial, or big, you know, like commercial aircraft. The only lodge they had was uh, McDonnell Douglas, was was 837. And uh, the 37s, I think, was, uh, they had about, they still got about four or five, or maybe even five, six lodges. You know, like the District 9 still has. Mm -hmm. But the only reason that we, as me and two more guys, wanted 
we wanted our own district because those guys was all with very much around aircraft and we were 25,000 members and there was no service. We did think there was because mm -hmm. uh, they had jobs everywhere else. And that's why we got a petition to start our own district and we won that. Well, had you tried to up. work with the Grand Lodge to get more representation out of District 9? Tried it, but it didn't work. And what were some of the issues that came up that they just weren't able to help you with? The uh, the ones that we all thought it was that they never was sober enough to help. You know, every time they all come around, they're drunk all the time. Even come in hearings with that. And uh, I, I thought that we had put up that. I got hold of the president, which was Roy C. Miller. I'm back to say what I want to say. Because he was a jackass from way back, Roy C. Miller. I don't know if you knew about it. He was international president before all this four or five for Burschenberger. Uh, yeah, Red Smith. Rick Smith was a nice guy. He and was then, us. And then there was somebody. No, that, Rick Smith was our directing BR. Uh huh. Red 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 Smith. Red Smith was mm -hmm. up there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there's a. There's somebody between him and Wimpasinger, I think. Yeah. But I always for I always forget. The best one they've had is. Uh, damn, I was a British name. Really a nice guy. He just George Corpus? Probably Buffettberger might have took his place. George Corpus? Joe Corpus. Uh-huh. He was a he was a nice guy. Corpus. Um Gene Glover. Gene Glover. Came out of a district nine. Gene Glover was a BR when I was got fighting to get get the district. Then he went to, we had that strike, well, I had strike, and we had a trusteeship that put us under, and he made the GVP of the, of the territory of Chicago. Glover came out of District 9, though, and made the GVP of, of this territory, and then he went to, up there. He was a nice guy, too. Mm. But the only one that bunch that was nice. I, I didn't like none of the rest of them. But, you know, I really got ready to get to fight them, to right. get her own district. That's what, right. well, I won't stay in the Machinist Union. All three of us did, and that's why we. And had and stay. you and who are the other two men you keep referring to? Gus Troyer. Gus. Gus. T R O Y E R. Yeah, T R O E Y. He made the director be art over here for a while. Mm -hmm. But he died in the office. And who was the other man? Uh, damn, I had his name by ago. Hmm. He was just a member. He didn't make nothing. Damn. Oof. No, it's fine. <laughs> if you think about it, we can get that yeah. later. So, so were th were there members yeah, they coming were, to you yeah. with issues that weren't being resolved? Right. So, how do you go up against? the Grand Lodge? How do you present an argument to them about forming a different district? Yeah, well, I didn't want to, I didn't form it at all in the district with them. See, I, I had to file a petition. I had to get enough signatures on the, of the members mm -hmm. to have a request that the, uh, they made us have an election. But, you know, Labor Board did. Mm -hmm. That's how we got out of District 9. And we won that election to make our own district. Okay. And that's the, the we had the wild they had the three weeks or had the wildcat strike, and then we had our contract ended that same year, and they C. Miller was here and they put us on uh, uh, some trusteeship. Trusteeship. I'm just I'm just trying to understand better what it's so it wasn't an issue that you had to present to the Grand Lodge. You the it, issues with District Nine. Right. Yeah. But but to form your own lodge, that was something you had to take to the Department of Labor to, right. to have an election. Right. And how many signatures do you get did you get? Do you remember? Over a, we had twenty five thousand members I had about twenty two thousand then. And we had a, over half of them on there. So that's how we got it. 
Okay. And then when the, uh, we went, we had, we voted between if you want to be eight thirty seven, lock local, our district eight thirty seven, which would be our district, and we got that. And the, the, um, the we had the contract, and then we went on. They took us on a trusteeship. Over, I was the secretary of treasurer, the shopster's body, the district I then, and I was the. They all hated my guts. I was an outsider because I was getting to get born in our own district and get rid of all those BRs. Mm -hmm. And uh, but that that's how we got it. Okay. And we got that in 1967. Mm-hmm. So you you got the signatures. Mm-hmm. As was the I'm I'm sorry I'm just trying to work out the time frame. Was the Wildcat strike before the vote? Wildcat strike before the vote. Before the vote, and why did people? Why did did y'all just walk out? And what? And did everybody walk oh, out? No, no, no. Just certain departments. Tooling, tooling division. We went out, got them to go out on the Wildcat strike. Mm -hmm. But all the rest of the people stayed to work. Mm -hmm. You know. What was so bad in the tooling division that y'all would risk? Probably uh, that had to be a company issue that the union didn't okay. have involved. It was just okay. the company, you know, trying to do something that we didn't like or thought. And that, that's why we struck. But typically, when there's a wildcat strike, you, we walked out. It's well, but it's because you're not getting a response from the company, mm -hmm. and right. you're not getting a response from the union that no. represents you. you we not, the company is you do it different than we want. We, okay. we didn't go out because we were getting represented from the union mm -hmm. because we, that would be wrong to strike. Mm -hmm. The companies when we had the Wildcat strike over. Okay. And then they said that, then you come back. And then when the contract's up and they took us on a trusteeship, they, our, our contract ended with, you know, with uh, McDon with, uh, McDonald Aircraft. And then January the 1st of September, or, or uh, 67 January, December, we start our new district, 837, but we're still under the contract, old contract for working all, we stayed the same. We had them had to negotiate a contract every year. Really? Oh, that's, that's hard. bad. That's hard. Yeah. That, that, that caused a couple of strikes, that every year thing. How long was that wildcat strike? Because you're talking about the well, war. About four days each time. Okay, well, yeah, they, they well, weren't they weren't lengthy. People just didn't show up for work for yeah, a few days. Right. And right when you came back from that, when you said you'd already voted to form your own district, so were you? So the the number that had been assigned to the local became. The number that was assigned to the district, right, and then the representative, the locals were broken up into a shop, right, through e shop. I remember, if I remember correctly, originally there were five different five different lodges. local lodges yeah. under the district. The district eight thirty seven. So, were you? Did the trusteeship happen during the transition period into making you your no, own the district? The trustee happened before we got was under district nine mm -hmm. and trusteeship. Oh, so it was actually District 9 that was under trustee. Right. Why? Who knows? It was international. You must have some idea. The international company. Well, they took us on a trusteeship, so why, why you go under a trusteeship, you get complaints that you're not being represented by the union. That's how come them to come in and put you on a trusteeship. Mm -hmm. You know, that. that's how we run a trusteeship under District 9. There was too many complaints. The union wouldn't represent us, so then they took them under trusteeship. And then when, when uh, I'd already made BR here, Cass Williams was a black guy that made the directive BR, and I told him, "You better do something because they're going to put you under trusteeship." And then he had another black guy that was with him. But apparently, he was his buddy. He said, "I said, I'm telling you, Cass." Don't listen to that guy. They tell me you got to go on a trusteeship. So why don't you retire before that's done? They're not going to do it. 
Well, they did. Four days later, we was on a trusteeship. I was the president of the retiree club then. But I the told president him, of what? The retiree club. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you jumped way ahead. Yeah, I did. I'm sorry. Yeah, <clears throat> but that's how that's how we got our, our we got our trusteeship. Okay. See that when you when they and you probably know it. Oh, you probably know it anyway, but to go on a trusteeship, you've got to apply to the international that we're not getting no res representative. We've got too many grievances nobody's doing nothing with. That's when they come in and take you on a trusteeship. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what happened to us twice. Didn't happen to me, but it happened to just before I got there in 68. I told you I jumped the gun. Yeah, you kind of, yeah, so. Why don't we forget all that and go back to what you just talked about, how we got out of District 9 and 837? Well, I, I think that this is, it's a really interesting case, okay. right, where right. you are part <coughs> of the district and you, and you are, aren't you don't feel like you're getting enough representation and so then you want to form your own i don't think that happens very often right. i know that there have been times in the past where the international has decided to redistrict things based on resources that mm -hmm. they have um but for a, a a local that is part of a district to say hey we need our own representation that they're not doing enough for us is a really unique that's not really what happened. Um, so then, I guess I'm just trying to understand <coughs> that that situation better. Like you said earlier, that maybe they weren't always responsive to issues you had. Do you think it's because they had, because it's hard to be responsive when you have a lot of other locals in your district, but also a local that has 25,000 members. Do you think that was that part was, of it? That was part of it, yeah. But see, and then, then we, got, when we went from District 9, we were, we were 837. So then we had to have it, they put that 837, A, B, C, and D, and E, to, to take it away from District 9. The Department of Labor might be did, I don't know. But we had to change something. Mm -hmm. to come in. Just like we had to change uh, the new thing that we got now, GKN was all in District 837, and they wanted to get out, mm -hmm. make their own. And we had to put an initial in there. So they got 387, but we still in the District 837. But that, they got to change something to make it different than what there was to start off. Did things work smoother under the new? Because you went from having 25,000 employees under one local to turning that local into a district and then breaking the workers out by the type of work done right. into five different locals. Right, right. So, so did that prove to help? It did help. It helped. And <clears throat> the only reason we broke down to small lodges now, they all got laid off. You know, that's how we had, we had to cut the lodges down. Mm. And that's why we're down now to A, B, and then, then 387. Mm -hmm. See, and that's all the reason. Right. Mm -hmm. All the reason to come to that 387, GKN wanted to get off. And, and I, I was just a, the president of the retired club. I said, you don't want that. Because I'd already been through with it when I was BR in St. Charles with the ladies. They wanted their own lodge, and they went from to make their own lodge, and then they they did they couldn't afford it. And when you say the ladies in St. Charles, what do you mean? What, were there well, mainly women workers? There weren't women workers. And what did they do? What was they were electronics? Electronics. Yeah. And they came out of a war crib that was the electronics, but they built over there and they called it conductron. The pay scale dropped a little different. So they had to make it something else. But then I had all those women over there too, and I told them that you can't, you got to keep your, what you got. 
and then when it, they voted to go among the sub because they had about three shops to us that was raised in hell and nobody rep us and the, them girls believed it and they said we're going to vote to get our own lodge. I said you listen to those shops to us and you're going to wind up in trouble. So enough sure enough it did. They went on their own and then they went on a strike and the first week they were on a strike they brought they all knew where I live, and they brought their babies with me about a week later and said, what are we going to do? I felt, I felt bad. I said, I tried to tell you ladies, in every meeting I had with you, don't listen to those shots because they don't know what they're talking about. Well, do you know what some of the particular issues were? Was it, was it a pay issue? Was it working conditions? No, it, it was just... Uh, I don't know what you call it. Um, they were trying to do probably what I did, in, you know, to get her in District 9 to get rid of that, that, but it was a different thing. But they just was trying to say that they wanted to come back and be on their own because they're one group, that's what the, the guys kept saying. And I said, it's not like that. And then, but they got like that, and that's, that's how I come up to go off on their own and they couldn't do it, then they busted them up and then we put them all back here then and then went to some other lodge. They did away with the E-Lodge, laid, laid half of them off, they lost their jobs, and then uh, the shop church had done all the raising hell, they thought they could come back over and be a plant chairman, mm -hmm. and I said, you don't, even, you don't even belong to this group, whatever you bullshit it over about, oh, you don't exist over here. Mm -hmm. So that they all got mad at me getting on that, but I told them, you, you guys did it on your own. About what year was that? Ooh. That was probably, uh, in the late 90s. Okay. Maybe, somewhere there. And you but said- it, it was after that, uh, it was before that 90-day strike we had. We had okay. a 13-week strike over there, and then it ended. Mm -hmm. But that's what that was. Okay. But it was all in the same group, you know, but they, and under the same union and all, but they wanted to go off on their own, just like GKN did. And now they, I don't know what's going to happen to them, but they sold a bit, company. They don't know what it is now. Right. It ain't GKN no more or something else. So over at, in St. Charles, you said that they worked with electronics. Right. Were they electronic components for the planes y'all build? Is that right. why they were expecting to? No, the jobs, the plane we build. Okay. Yeah. And and so that's why they were expecting to co just come over here when their plans didn't work out. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I gotta I gotta connect all the dots because right. you know the stories, but anybody I understand. listening to this or watching this might not. Well, see. Electronics came out, the conductor came out, the war crib that was here in building two that, but the let Did you say war? War yeah, crib. They, they called it the war crib because it was all electronics in there. Mm -hmm. Put all the war and the airplane and all that. So they sent all those girls, most of them, that was lower paid scale to St. Charles and called it conductron. And that's where. You know, most of it was women, but they still stayed under our union. Eight under your district. Under District Eight Thirty Seven. Mm -hmm. Because they were nowhere in District Nine. And does, is District Nine still here? In a, oh yeah. And and District Nine's got everything except. What they had, they were having nothing but Boeing and McDonald here. Okay. <clears throat> and District 9 now is, I have them to cover up my meeting, I make them sit on a stage. And they thought I was against all of them. I said, no, I just against the guys that wasn't representing us. And hell, I'm still a machinist man, I'll always will be that. I went for the team and you ain't doing all that. And when I bring these guys over, like Jim Brown, he was, was the general vice president. Remember his name, Jim Brown? 
he was uh, he was a nine. He was not a district nine, but he was okay. a younger guy. None of the guys that was there when I got the blame Claude to get rid of them mm. was older guys, maybe some older than me, but none of them's around. And these younger guys, they they just know the story. You know, they know that right. Claude was a rat. I guess they call him because of it. But all I was is a, somebody wanted to get some representation for the membership. And I yeah. thought I wouldn't want to get rid of the machinists. Mm -hmm. That was the difference in what's in there now. But then, now, we have a, we have a lot of music at, at District 9. We had a lot of shows over there. And, and I tell them, the guys come to see me, you know, even one of the old presidents, I made him sit on the stage, he liked to had a heart attack, you know. Tell him not that way. On the stage? Yeah, on my stage. I don't want him sitting down there in the crowd. Right. He comes to visit me, I want him up there on the stage. Mm -hmm. So I always talk to him, they can talk to him. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I see. Same way a couple of international men in there now. They get that down that audience. Hey man, I don't want you down there. You get up here, mm -hmm. cause you down there, they maybe you're throwing something at you, and I'd be hit. You get on the stage with me, you know. I'm not gonna get up there. So, you started in '55. We're gonna back up and talk just about you right now. Oh, okay? I'm sorry. No, don't apologize. Yeah. Don't apologize. Um, and you became a shop steward. Uh, for local 837, when it was still under District 9, right. in 1956, and you were a shop steward for about 10 years, you said. Till, till yeah. Until you until, were elected. Uh, 67, yeah. Okay. Um, so, tell me about that. What were some of the grievance issues? Do you remember? Really, I hardly ever wrote a grievance. I took care of myself. You know, because I, I couldn't get them anyway, so I just handled it all myself. I, I, I wrote a few grievances, but I I dealt with uh, the management that knew me and all, and I could get more done with them than I could have grievances anyway, because I had all the building too on second shift, had the whole building, and I don't have any people that's in there, mm -hmm. but. Uh, I, I really went around and tried to solve the problem myself, tried to run a little common sense and this and that, mm -hmm. and uh, and I didn't have too many grievances. Now, the, the grievance was out in maintenance and tooling and all that. I went down and do it. That's where it all was. Right. You know, that, but, would but, you, because it sounds like you would just try to talk to the worker, talk to the management, right. and try to work it out before anything right. really happened. Right. Do you feel that uh, management was more approachable then? That they were that they were people that it oh, was they were easy. More, yeah. It, then the management was would listen to that stuff. Yeah. You know, now I don't know what goes on now. Okay. Well, even even before about the time I really left and quit dealing directly with the president. Mm -hmm. A lot of my reps would say that, you know, they couldn't get along with it. I said, well, maybe you didn't try to get along, you know. So, but it's uh, it's a different thing over now. Boys, different people. Yeah. I'm hearing that they're really bad. I don't know. But we don't have too many members over there either. So, I, it just, I don't know. Our new members we got now, uh, they never understand unions. They hate unions. That I that I talk to you know, and I try to tell them that, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. If you didn't have a union, you wouldn't have no job, and you wouldn't have no benefits if you had a job. But that's the difference with guys then and now. They uh, back then the the guys really knew what a union did, and these young guys they don't they don't understand it. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I don't know. They uh, they probably never was taught talked about union by their parents because it was all you know something else. But I don't understand it at all.
So after being shop steward, you became a business rep for District 9. Not all. 837. It was as it was it was as it was changing. So your first elected position for the for the newly formed District Lodge eight thirty nine was as a business rep. As a district eight thirty seven. District eight thirty seven. Yeah. Um so what was that like? Like when I came from shop steward to to uh, yeah yeah I mean it was a transition right yeah well I moved up you moved up but you weren't on the shop floor was it a full time position at the time it took you off the shop floor no when I when I became BR mm -hmm. you know I, I just went in the, on the shop floor if they needed me if they called me or not but I would go out on my own and go around and ask the guys how stuff was going and all that. But but I guess the the question I'm asking is, were you still working at the shop no, no, and no. doing this part time? So you were still, but when I say off the shop floor, you so you were no longer doing the job you'd been no, I, hired to do. Then I was working for the union. In yeah, sixty eight. Yeah. I was paid by the union, worked for the union. Mm -hmm. And the, really, the only reason I could get the plan, if I call labor relations and tell them I'm coming out there, the BRs had to do that. But I never did. I just went out there. You know, mm -hmm. I had badge. And I'd, I'd go ask the members and see how they were doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the first four years. And then, but why, what made it so bad, when I got to where I was going to have the election for uh, who the BRs was, you know, I wasn't going to run. And the BRs of District 9 told me, said, you lost your mind? You were one of the guys that got rid of us to get BRs, and you're not going to run? And, and and I ran. And that's well, you're probably right. And that, that's because I didn't want, I didn't think I was qualified to start with, you know, to really do the job. Mm -hmm. But then I, 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 I ran and got it, and it stayed there. But it represented, uh, and, uh, I had uh, there was, I had I had I had <coughs> I had had all elections under District Nine to make a new district, and I had them that at hotel, and then I I was still a secretary of treasurer of the shopsters by the only one in the crowd, and I'd tell the guys if you don't waive your bylaws, that you that you do get fifty one percent, you won't have no election. You can't win. No one. We had about 30 and 40 guys running for one job. You're not going to get it. And Everett Lodge did it except D Lodge. They called me a District 9. And then what I was talking about, I'm telling you, when I made a BR and he's still with me in the retirement club, I said, you do what you want to do, but I'm telling you, if you don't waive those bylaws that do with that 51%, you're not going to have nobody run for a ballot. For a BR, well, they didn't have it, so I told him you can't, you can't have a BR for three months. We had to have another election, but that's a, I was still such a treasure shopsters, and that's how come those guys three months behind us. Mm. But we, we had eight BRs elected at our first eight, 387, our district 837 in January. Those guys were three months late, you know, two or two lot, one lot, but that's how we got it. So, you were BR for four years, and then you were assistant BR, starting in 1971 or 72? Two. 72. How did the responsibilities change moving up from BR to assistant BR? Oh, you might have to be a half-ass boss maybe for an assistant. <laughs> but it really, the assistant is the director if he's gone. And if he's not, he, the assistant is just someone to be the assistant. You know, that BR points the assistant like we do in all lodges. But uh, it was about the same. But the BRs under me, 
if they couldn't get nothing done, they always blamed Claude. It's his fault. And that, and I, that I, it, I took it a lot that it was my fault because I I'd get on them and you're not trying to do your job. And if I did what well, hadn't done it, then I'd tell them that you know you should have done it to start off with. Mm -hmm. And then in '80, when they uh, when they went against me, my ones I got in office went against me in '80. Is why I lost the election. One of the reasons. Mm -hmm. The biggest reason was. We had an absentee election. You know what absentee is? Like, you know, uh, like where people... They, you, mark, you get an absentee ballot. Mm -hmm. You mail to your house, you vote it, and it comes back. Mm -hmm. Okay? The only way you get an absentee ballot is come to the Secretary of Treasurer's office. You get it, take it with you, they'll mail your ballot, and you mail it back to these guys. I've had, I had no telling how many people out there told me, Claude, all we did that ballot, we come in and put our name on it and give it to one of the other guys and they marked it. And I said, I understand that. But that only reason I got beat for the election, but I didn't care because the guy that ran against me was supposed to be a good friend of mine, uh, brag about a church member and all that, and stay at, at my house a lot of times I'm going home. But I told him, do what you want to do. I've done enough that, but that that that, that, that absentee ballot election is what cost this election. Ever, and it's the trivial thing it is, is the absentee ballot. So, because there was, the way they were handled was fraudulent. And you, well, it. So you had been at that point. For over 20 years, you had been an off, you know, from shop steward up to directing business rep. You had been really active and a, and a leader. Um, what was it like for you when you lost that election? I came in saying that song, whatever it'll be, will be to my secretaries. Okay. <laughs> okay, sera, sera. Because it, you know, I, I said, what I've done. I do what I want. I'm still that. And then I went back in the shop. How was that? Well, uh, it was really. Had, had it, it changed a lot since you had left? Well, it, it was about. I went back to the same building. It was, changed, it was there. But then uh, when uh, one of the guys that higher ups didn't like me too much, so they tried to transfer, transfer me over to 101. To a job that I set up to make the most of be some more work with advanced fab, and I told him I don't want to go, you know, and uh, so the labor relations man, I went to him. He said, "Well, I said, I told you I don't want to go. What you want to do, you do what you want to do." But I went because they said, you know, this is your job. So I got over there and the the, gym, the superintendent, man, I'm glad you're over here. You can be a shop steward. I don't want none of that shopster does it yet. And I said, I don't want to stay over here. And I ain't going to be here. So do what you want to do. And they're working four hours over every day. And I thought, I'm not going to do that. Four hours over? Over. Overtime. So working four hours of overtime every day of the week. Yeah. 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 And uh, I, I told him I'm not going to do that. Well, I had to wait till. My superintendent was on vacation to get back to call him and tell him I'm come, I want to come back to building two to my old job. And I came back. I got a week's overtime pay and put in that building two hours. <laughs> yeah, because I thought I'm not going to stay. Well, then when I came back to my building two, then I did take lead man. I told him I'll take, they me supervisor and everything else. I'll take lead man, but that all I did, I ran the paint shop and rode a damn bicycle a long time for the next seven years while I did not retire, yeah. But that was, uh, it was, that I was better off riding that bicycle than I was, I guess, the BR. But I, I stayed active. I came to my, memory, I came to my meeting and all that, but mm -hmm. I never did. 
And you did that from 80 to 89, which is when you retired? Yeah. Right. But you were you formed the retirees group yeah. in seventy in nineteen seventy. Right. So why was that there a need a for? Well, actually, before we talk about retirees, so from the time you started and and had been there under District Nine and then formed eight thirty District eight thirty seven until you retired in nineteen eighty nine, there must have been a huge decline in jobs and membership. At the, at the plant. They were. I mean, from twenty, from about twenty, you said twenty-two thousand at right. one point, yeah. all the way. I think there's a. I think I remember somebody saying there's about six, three thousand jobs now. Yeah. And and so it was probably still higher than that when you retired. The, the, the highest, no, when I retired, it was dropped down a little bit. Yeah. It was dropping yeah. down. But when I had the RC election mm -hmm. in the plant. We had, that's where we had the 25,000. Uh -huh. The RC election? Yeah. Uh, R C, what does RC stand for? See, RC stands for you. The labor board's putting the election on party. Okay. Yeah. Okay. See, team, like I got enough signatures to have an election between District 9 and 837. They had enough signatures to, to try to form their own district team in, the, in McDonald's then. And that's... Uh, but the UAW didn't just put a, all they had to have one card in, they could be in that election. Mm -hmm. So that made three people on that ballot to win that election inside the plant with 25,000 members. And that's when I had to tie vote and had to run it over and then we got our, own, we got our, our state district 837. But uh, that's what the RC election is. And it, it was inside the plant voting in there. Mm -hmm. But as membership declined over the years, how did that affect the workers? Oh, some got better off and some, you know, maybe got a better job, but the guy getting laid off with no seniority. Mm -hmm. See, the layoff is strictly seniority. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would, layoffs hurt everybody when they started off doing it. But then when we lost the 812 aircraft with the jackass we had up there for our senator, we lost 10,000 members in about three days. And what year was that? Oh, that was in the 80s, so I'd probably say middle of 80s. 80 was, it laid off of quite a few in the late 70s. But then the, when it catch late 12, that's what really got us. Not only the union company got laid off too, mm -hmm. you know, the company workers. So when you are in a community, you know, St. Louis is a big city, but I feel like this district is its own community. Mm -hmm. And 10,000 jobs gone overnight is will really impact right. a compu a community. Um, how did the international respond to that? They laid off two BRs, and the district picked up their salary and left them there. Like we got one year that way now, but that when the the layoff hit international, wanted to cut say they pay half that salary, mm -hmm. so they cut their BRs off too. So they lost two BRs. That that's how that. That's why we only only have three BRs now. Mm -hmm. International says they can't afford no more that. But the big big layoffs like that would get the membership, will also get some of the represent, representatives too. Right there, that's what happened there. But I mean, did the international have anything in place to help? Or assist all the workers that had been laid off? Nothing? All they did is cut the pay on the hat. They didn't want to pay half the salary. Yeah. See, BR, international pays half salaries at BR. And they, when they wasn't on membership, they cut it off, mm -hmm. cut it down. And in the late 80s, 
That's also when Eastern was striking. Right. And and a lot of machinists lost their jobs from that too. Mm -hmm. In ninety one when they finally yeah. shut down. Were y'all were there calls to have um to demonstrate in solidarity with Eastern here? Do you know? I don't I don't really know. Yeah. I don't really know. Um, okay. So back to my question about you started the retirees club in nineteen seventy, long before you retired. Why well why was it important for you to uh have that in place for retirees. Retirees, we we just, you know, th said why don't we have a retiree club? Because the retiree club, I don't know if uh, I don't think District Nine even had one. I don't know, but we just uh, me and the director were talking about what these retirees going to do. That's been working here, mm -hmm. and why don't we start a retiree club and let them meet right in our hall once a month. And that, that's how we got that started. Mm -hmm. But uh, then, one of our retirees, if he retired in two years' time, he was gone. But he didn't last that long. So then, uh, but uh, as it grew along, the retiree club built up a little bit. And then when they, uh, like about the time, uh, oh, maybe 80, Oh, maybe got 87, 89, and just about the time I retired, the retired club had really built up, mm -hmm. but not as big as it did. And then uh, when I took president of it in probably about 92, we had about 250 people that came to our meeting every month. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, you know, I stayed there as a president since then. What are but the now our membership dropping a little bit because you know, they're getting old like me, and then they, they, they're not lucky to stay on. But mm -hmm. that, that's how we got the retiree club up. So what are some of the activities of the retirees club? It's just a social club, really. In fact, I used to have all my paperwork put out, 837 Social Retiree Club, because that's how we was. Mm -hmm. And uh, the lover I talked you know, talk about was a nice guy, and uh, the other guy, the international president, uh, we named him and I said he was nice. See, they had a retired club up there for BRs like me. And they, when I go to the BR club, a lot, I went to that a lot. And they say, Todd, why don't you join our retired club? And I say, I will. You send me a ticket the night before the retired club, and pay my dues, and I'll join your club, you know. In the head with them. But that, that's how. They're retired. When uh, when I was the president, if I'd go anywhere, whoever did, that he talked to him because he has the biggest retired club in the Machinist Union. Not only anywhere in the state of Missouri, but I got the biggest retired club. But that's, that's how the retirees. We just, just want to start it and have it that they had something to do to come and visit each other, you know, and that's why I call it a social club and mm. that's all it is. We don't we don't get involved in too much. We we do get a lot of active and you know, have uh, representatives and people come talk to us and gets involved, but that's what it is. That's why I call it a social club. Some of them don't like it, but that's all it is, you know. It's just something to try to get the membership to still be involved in the union. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when you were, you know, when you first joined the union in the 50s, Did was there a, a ladies' auxiliary for any of the locals here? Do you remember the ladies' auxiliaries that used to be made up of, like, wives and daughters of no. union members? No. Do you know what I'm talking about? <coughs> yeah. Y'all never had one here? Uh, didn't have it. Now, they were a, a few women shop stewards, back when I was shop steward, you know. Mm -hmm. if but, you they were, huh? but they were working. Workers, but right. They weren't married to, no, to uh, union members necessarily. No, you really have that. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you retired in 1989, and you set up the Retirees Club in 1970, but didn't become the president until 1992, and are you still acting president? You haven't had any competition? Oh, few. Yeah? We have elections every three years, just like... You know, the company, but I think I had two that ran against me, but nobody else has run, you know. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, some of us, I, uh, they get upset with me, some of them, but the radicals, that, you know, if, if you, uh, the way I set up a long time ago, we have a meeting. You come in, I all start talking and talking. If somebody hits that floor with that mic, I done it. You shut up, listen a while, you know. And a lot of them clap my hand. A clear hand when I tell them to be quiet, you know, because you want to take a meet and take it outside or something other. And uh, but before I took over, they they just did what they want to do. And I said, no, we shouldn't do it this way. And uh, especially if I got somebody in that speaker, you know, that they ought to listen to what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 uh, I'm pretty strict on my vice president is too. He been there a good while too now. Mm -hmm. Why has it been important for you to remain involved? Beg pardon? Why has it been important to you to remain involved with the district? Just to stay active, I guess, have something to do and enjoy doing something. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm probably involved in too much, really. What else are you involved in? Well, the guide dogs, I do a lot for that. And uh, the, guy, the bowling, we do uh, barbecue at all the golf tournaments, being my vice president, do that. And, just, just, to, just to do stuff, yeah. We have a barbecue for the retirees once a year, and fish fry once a year, and uh, three or four golf tournaments we do all the work for that. Just, you know. And if I'd take, if I'd leave it, I'd leave it to Jim, and he'd pick it up. Is Jim your vice president? Yeah. When did he retire? Oh, when uh, probably when Boeing took over, they lost a lot of tooling people, and he was one of them that they laid off, okay. laid him off. Probably in. Oh, uh, ninety in the late nineties, maybe, or because okay. they took over, I think, about ninety six. Boy, somewhere in there. But he'd been retired quite, you know, quite a bit, quite long. Not like me, but he he'd been retired. Um. Did you ever know of a guy name of? Uh, Damn, I just lost his name. He was, uh, he worked up, he was, uh, worked in international as, uh, in the finance department. Steve Dunn. He, he worked for the guy that come in and took us on a trusteeship, was was a treasurer for quite a while. 
before Glover got there. Oh, he's about to replace Glover. What the hell's his name? I anyway, his ex-wife is my vice president's wife now. So I knew them a long time too, yeah. But he uh he had to retire from medical. But uh he's uh he's moved back over to Illinois now. Steve Dunn. The yeah. Help a nice guy. I don't recognize his name. Yeah, he was uh he was a he was a sector treasurer of this district for a while. Then he got to be auditor, and then they put him set him up there in finance department up there. And I tried to get him to go, but I said your wife's not gonna go with you because I knew him, you know. And I said his dad, 92 years old, and he ain't, she ain't going. Mm -hmm. So he went, and a couple of years there's a divorce. That's what happens sometimes. Well, can you think of anything we didn't talk about that you feel is important to get on the record? No. You sure? I, I uh, I, I told you about how we got the, uh, the election that we had to have uh, inside the plant. You know, with 22,000 members. Mm -hmm. Tell, how did that, how was that set up? That's a lot of people to coordinate for an election. Yeah. We had to have, the team had signatures to force me into that election. So they went out and got members, where you sign up for a team for an election and all. That's how that got there, like all of them. And then that, it, we voted inside the plant. You know, all of you voted outside and put the ballots in. But each, we had the, Cafeteria over there was a big room, and every all the buildings around and voted and sent boxes over. They put put them all in that one room. That's where they counted them. And the company had a guy watching it. The union had a guy watching it, and the labor the board labor board had a guy watching when they come across that ballot. And uh, I was watching as a as a, then I was the. Uh, I don't know if I, I think I was the assistant director here at the end. And I did the watch it and challenge those two ballots. Them girls told me what they're going to put on there. And that, that's how we got the election. And then uh, the next one, I had them run over, run the retire over it. UAW got out and then we won that election with two teams. Mm -hmm. And uh, that happened probably 73 in there because of, or he got to be, we had a new district in 72. Gus Troyer came in. Mm -hmm. When you were trying to form District 837, were you ever afraid that you wouldn't get enough support from the membership to do it? Did you ever have a time when you worried that you, you, oh. you wouldn't be able to? I don't. Maybe not. I, I don't. I really. I don't, they, they was also unless they all told me stories. You know, they were all really upset that we don't like district dying. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that helped a little bit. But when we, uh, our lawyer's done a real good job because he do. He he was St. Louis. He knew everything in here, and I think that might have helped us. It may be. The international body got that guy that I said he was a jackass, female, he might have just said the hell with it, you know. I just, well, they'll still be machines, we'll just make them their own district. And I don't know what happened. I hope maybe the good Lord might have us and all that. But uh, that that's how we got it. But they, they lost a lot of money, you know, so that's why they got. We had to split it, split everything down. We got half, they got half, and uh, they got wound a bit better than we did. But at least we got our own district, and then we had our election. They started our local lodges, and that was uh, that was a lot of hours put it away from home, and, and you know, but that, that's what I enjoyed doing because I was on the 
really, I really always liked people and tried to make everybody get happy. And, and sometimes it was, it was a, a wonder, mm -hmm. especially when I, Gus was the one I really pushed for the director after I had the first guy with me. And his brother was a carpenter, and the carpenters union was, I tried to get along with them because we was all union people, and we did. We had our labor relations, we had our meetings down there together. And they'd tell me, why are you supporting Gus? And I said, well, he's a friend of mine. We've been together a while. He's a union buster. I what the hell are you talking about? He said he's got his own business and, and building boats and all in St. Charles, where you live, and all non-union people. I said, you've got to be wrong. So I come in and asked him, what the hell are you doing? Uh, he said, that's my brother, which it was, mm -hmm. but he was involved in that too. That's why after I got to really find him out better, I, I didn't know I didn't know if he's that, if he's that good friend or not. But then he uh, died on me, so I didn't have to worry about it anyway. But that's how I come with the director. That's how I come to the director. He passed away, and I was the assistant. Mm -hmm. But uh, you, uh, when you. When you have 25,000 members you're trying to please, somebody's going to be upset with somebody. It ain't going to work that way. Mm -hmm. and, uh, even with the, with our union ship over here, we had all, I had eight reps working for me and they can't all be pleased either. But you've got to have one, you, one thing, we're going to do it this way, or we're not going to do it, then you could be a BR. Or director, mm -hmm. but if you let somebody else go one way or the other, you're not doing your job to start with, and that may be what we got a problem with some of the now. But you know, but I don't know. I know when I was here, I tried to do what I, the best I could do, and and uh, it might, it probably wrong because they got rid of me and didn't want me around no more, so I didn't care. But that's when you find out what your friends are, yeah. when you do that. But I always said, no matter what, I want to stay in the machinist union. I never did try to get out of that. And a lot of my friends said, uh, why do you want to do that when we get team and all that? You don't know what you want. You don't need no team. And uh, so that's, that's, we stayed dead and we're still in the machinist union. And they paid me a pretty good living for a few years, which I can still get a couple of dollars from them. So <laughs> yeah. I guess that's it. But I've enjoyed it. And uh, if I did, I wouldn't be doing what I do now. And I know I've made a few guys happy and a few guys sad and a few guys enemy, especially the ladies. The ladies? Yeah. Your enemies? They, they don't like Claude much. The bunch I got here, they... Oh, the ones from St. Charles? Well, no. The ones that, like the Raymond's Committee, mm -hmm. and they don't care much for me. How so? Well, I won't let them come in to my retired club and sell their cookies and all for their money when I tell them that if I have anything in here I give away, it's for the guide dogs. And I sell and I sell tickets at my meeting for the guide dogs, and I have drawings for them and let them win half the money, and I take the other half the money and put it in the guide dog. Well, they thought they could come in and you know and sell their cookies and all, and and I did tell a couple of them. I said, now if you girls want to make my cookies and cakes for my meeting. I'll start buying them from you, you know, and then you can do what you want to do with it. Oh, that'd be fine. And I said, now, you know, I meet every second Thursday and I have dinners for them now. 
and are you going to be responsible that I get your cookies and cakes every Thursday, every month? Mm -hmm. Well, then they look at each other and they don't know. I wait a minute. If you don't know, I don't know. I'm not going to do with you. And I said, they said, well, we want to just come in and sell her. No, you're not going to do that either. And they went to the, these guys and they said they'll talk to me. And I said, then when you talk, they ain't going to do it. So they go to the international, you know. And when they called me, and I told them, I said, I run retired club and they're not going to come here. And they don't like me for that, but they're getting, they're getting better on it. But, but I, I told them, I, I, I can't do that. You know, all, all, all I want to do with my retirees is help us as much as we can because they don't make as much money as you girls do. And, but I'll help you with your cookies that you service if you give me them every because I have cookies or cakes for them every month and I'll do that but they wouldn't be sure they just wouldn't come in and sell them I'd buy them going to do that mm -hmm. just to get off of it but sometimes I can, they're bad sometimes they do and I don't care have you made any other groups mad? oh no I don't, no? I don't think so I, uh, I, my kids are scattered all over the world. I don't know. Your about. children? Yeah. I got some boys, two boys in Michigan. Okay. And uh, one boy in California. Okay. And. Uh, you have three more boys. About three boys that lives in Louisiana. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's my first wife's kid, you know. Okay. And then, but my girls, they live in St. Charles. All of them? Oh, my stepdaughter lives in Maryland, Baltimore, Maryland. Okay. What do they do for a living? All your kids, generally. What, what, what do they do? What do they do for a living? Oh, I don't know what all of them do. Uh, now, d my... You don't know what your kids do for a living? Huh? You don't know what your children, what kind well, of work they, they do? Uh, Have your kids retired? Oh, the boy in California, he retired, I'm sure of that. Mm-hmm. But, uh... The boys that lose the end, I'm thinking they are truck drivers, I believe the last time I heard about them. Okay. And uh, my daughter, oldest daughter, she retired from uh, that, uh, I can't think of it, big company on the corner, but now she works for uh, the insurance company, uh, Blue, not Blue Cross, but it's United Healthcare. I always started work for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, her and her husband got a, got a bar. She works at that all the time. And then my youngest daughter, she works for the health department, go around and take care of the older people, you know. And uh, then their kids and their grandkids, and then I got about nine great grandkids live around. St. Charles. Wow. But when they all get together, they got a crowd. <laughs> yeah. But I, all my family's gone on my side, though. I'm the only one left in that. And my wife, she's the only one left in her family. How old is your wife? Uh, I believe about 85. Is there a lot of longevity in your family? Do do people usually live to a to a a good age? Oh yeah, my mother lived a hundred years for six months. Smart as a tick, I'm telling you. She her hundred birthday, she had about ninety people visit. That my sister had a big house, big yard, and all. Us kids would try to name them. And my mother said, that's not their name. 
name every one of them. And they was all kin to her, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, are you sure, Mom? I'm. Sh you don't know their names. And her hundred, the, the night she died, she was, she didn't want to go to the hospital. She, my dad died when he was 77. And then, uh, then my mother lived with one of her daughters for a while, but then she wanted to go to a nursing home to build that she liked there, you know. And, and that's where she was till she died. But she fell and broke her hip in 95. And I said, this is it, she ain't gonna make it. So I went to the hospital and told her, don't put her on no machine, nothing, because I was, on the boy that was left and all that. I said, and she all oh, should be all right. Three days she was going to get out of bed. Mm -hmm. Never had stayed there. But then every time we had her out for lunch or something or other, she'd talk a while like she, well, I'm ready to go home, you know. <laughs> she'd go, we'd, we'd take her home. Yeah. But she mm -hmm. was a tough gal. But she made a hundred for six months. Maybe I'll hope I'm do better. Oh, I don't know. But my oldest brother, we was always pretty close. He's two years older than me. He was going to get married to uh, an ex-service girl that divorced when he was uh, probably about 18 years old, maybe 19. And mom thought a fit. You know, she didn't want him to. And I said, Mom, why don't you want him to marry that? He's been going with her, but you don't know, been buddy buddy. Well, she's been divorced. And that, that upset me, you know. I was probably about 16 or maybe younger than that. I said, you know what, Mom? When I get ready to get married, and you tell me who I'm going to marry, you ain't going to be my mom. <laughs> But anyway, the boy didn't get married. Wait, just 40 years old, three months he got killed in the car wreck. Mm -hmm. That like to got me. But he'd, uh, he'd had all kind of wrecks. We worked on a farm, hauled logs and all. He had big wrecks and all. He drove a truck all the time. It had a new truck and he lived over where in Illinois and it was a, a bank like. And kind of foggy. He went to the end of that road, you had to go one way to another. And he ran that bank, and his wife went through the windshield and that steering wheel, I guess, hit his chest. He lived long enough to the hospital to notify my sister it was, and, and, he, and he passed away. Mm -hmm. But she made it. But uh, she went through the windshield. But I said, Mom, you tell me I'm going to marry you. You ain't going to be my mom. You know? But I didn't really think it was none of her business. And then I really got upset with her after later on when I found out that her, even in her, some of them family, a couple of them were divorces. And I asked her, why would you worry about the divorce when you had three or four people in your family already divorced? Divorce don't mean nothing. If you don't get along, get a divorce. You know, why, why stay to get in a fight all the time? But she didn't figure that out. Uh, I don't know. She was a tough gal, mm -hmm. and how she raised eight kids, made a garden out of this world, and of course, Dad always had milk cows and hogs and all that. Stuff. Well, that's the way it goes. I guess. Uh, My boy worked at McDonald a little while. He was, he joined the union, but then he wouldn't go to work for absentee. They would let him go. And then they, he went and got married. And then Nate, the president, I was going to try to get him back. And he said, well, if he got married, we'll try him again, bring him back. Same, another year he was out. I put him on every shift out there that he could have his work, you know, he wanted. He'd go fishing or hunting and go to sleep and forget to go to work and go in late and all. And if you worked for McDonald Douglas and you got fired, you fired yourself for not coming to work. Because 
they didn't like to bar people out. Now Boeing, I'm hearing they get a lot, and it's the same thing, absentee. You know, they're not. They just they just ain't gonna put up that absentee. And I tell I've told them for a long time, you no use arbitrate absentees because no one wins our arbitrations in absentee. No one gets a job back, and no young unions, nobody. They just they don't want them. They won't come to work, but they don't want them. Right. Yeah. What What about uh, your family? Do you got a family? I do. I have parent. Well, my mom, and I have a sister. But you never was married. Briefly. Recently, you got married. Briefly. Or oh, briefly. <laughs> oh, I didn't wear long. But like you said. Oh, you don't get along. You're better off. Why stay married? Yeah, better off. There ought to be another day, right? Yeah. About four years, I guess, I was married. My second wife. I should have shot her. (gasps) (laughs) Not really. She was really the cause of my first divorce. And I really thought, you know, that she would love me. After 20 years of marriage, she come to me and told me, says, uh, I've had a boss all my life. I'm going to file for divorce. I said, you lost your mind? I was ripped then. was when I was a BR director or something. Never seen him my paycheck. I just give it to her. Never nothing. And I said, what the hell do you mean a boss? You know, she said, well, I'm, I, I'm gonna do that. And we, and we had to have two girls and two boys. My daughter just finished get married. And I told her, I said, you know what, lady? You caused me my first divorce with my family. You didn't want, to, you didn't want me to tell these families that I had other kids, you don't want to ever do that, and you want to do this to me? When you hand me them papers, I'm going to do like the read paper, I'm going to blow your ass off, you know. And uh, so I said, the hell with it, that's what you want to think. And when she gave me the papers, I gave her everything, I just gave her everything I had. I just had bought her a new car. All that shit. And uh, we went to a lot of, I, I always liked to dance. And we went to a lot of dancing and all. And I told her, I said, okay, if that's what you want, you got it. I, I did ask her, she run around a bunch of girls. I did ask her, are you turned to Desmond? Are you a damn lesbian? I did ask her that last time I was there. But we'd go out dancing, and she'd see me to dance and all. And she'd be knocking on my door by the time I got back to my, where I had my room at. That. And I told her, you know, this play party's gonna come over with. And then when she found out I was gonna marry this girl I'm married to, she come back and tell me she made all kind of mistakes and all that, you know, and I said, that's right, it's too damn late to worry about them. Now, I, my boys won't talk to her, mm. you know, and she blamed me for it. And I said, no, I, not, don't give me that shit. You start living with boys, but younger than your kids, and boys don't play that. Now, the girls, they, they can get over that, but the boys don't. And my boys now won't talk to her. And uh, if they say something to me, and I said, well, that's your mother. You know, you got to say your mother. but. She's, that's, you know, it's my fault and all. I don't, I don't talk to her. I don't want to be around her. But I'm, she's so close, I see her all the time. But mm-hmm. in her and my wife now, they talk. When we first got married, she was mad because she married me and told her she, gonna, she, worked, she was a nurse working for my, for my doctor that I went to. And she told her, I'm going to have your job. And Mary said, go ahead, you know. <laughs> Don Feller saying, she wouldn't get your job, you know, like that. 
But they'd talk on the phone to each other. I'd tell them, I don't even want to talk to you. But she really, now she really thinks I'm a jackass, but you know, I just ignore it. No, but I think on my 90th birthday, was probably at my daughter's, and, and uh, the kids was all there, and she was there. I, she said, I'm gonna hug your neck on your birthday. I said, no, you told me that I was your dad, you don't hug my neck, you know. <laughs> so I just, yeah, it, it went through hell. But I would really tore up when she wanted all this, but man, I've thanked the good Lord a lot for it since. I've been married just for 40 years, mm -hmm. 40 years. 40 years. 40. Yeah. And she used to come to my retired club a lot. You know, now her back hurts a lot. And she, uh, she still goes to the beauty shop every Thursday. Like, no, every Wednesday. Today's Wednesday with the beauty shop. Because it's funny, this morning she was in the bathroom and I went in to shave and I said, what, Why are you in here so early for? Looking so pretty. I said, Wait a minute. Today is beauty day. <laughs> She said, yeah. <laughs> yeah, beauty day. But she had one daughter and, and she got one grandson. And uh, she got a little, little granddaughter was, uh, oh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know, there you uh, What, what is a baby that's, that's really not right? Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. She's got a, a little granddaughter. Mm -hmm. but be, she's five years old, but she's really doing good. But she's, uh, and my boys didn't really know that till the last couple of years. It really got them, you know, because they didn't live off and they always liked Chad. But I tell them right now, he is, but he's got a good job. He, uh, they send him to Germany all the time. He's an engineer. He really come out good, but uh, all of them. Mm. Well, I don't know. So are we missing anything else? I don't know. You tell me. You, uh, I, uh, I didn't get out of the union. I didn't go Teamsters. I didn't stay there. But, I ain't gonna change. I, my daughter, that tastes good, but the older guys, she tells me, Dad, you keep doing what you do. Don't stop. You know, she said a lot of her, she's a lot of, lost a lot of her friends that she took care of that really got her. You know, just even women and men, you know. You keep doing what you're doing. You, you'll be all right. Both of my daughters do that. And, and the boys, they tell me to do the same thing, you know. They tell me to keep doing something, to keep acting. And before my mother died, I was, I went to Saxton practically every day or every three or four days. And I stayed there a lot of times because me and my brother had cattle and I took care of them. But when she died, then I just, well, then I had my knee surgery on my right knee, and this left and I was supposed to hit about two years ago. And I thought, when I, I, my, my legs swelled up so big, I was uh, working my flower, my wife's flower, and I kind of stuck my foot under a screen and fell, and hit the flower pot, and I had them big sunglasses on and cut my face real bad. Mm -hmm. So I, my daughter lived real close to us, and my wife went, she just went berserk, bleed like a pig. I was on Cumin, and you know, after that surgery. And they, she come over and we're gonna call the hospital. I said, just give me a pan of water and let me wash and see how bad I bleed. You know, my nose and all. Well, I finally got the bleed stop. And then they said, we want you to take you to emergency. No, I'm all right now. Mm -hmm. And next morning when I got up, looked in the mirror, <laughs> 
to him, I looked like bad. And then she said, you're going to the doctor. Well, I called the doctor. And he couldn't see me, but the nurse petitioner would. So I went in and see her. And she come in the office and she looked at me and she said, oh, Claude, I can't, I can't see you. you I got to have the doctor. She was about six months pregnant, you know, but, but I did look bad. And then uh, he come in, he said, I told you Mary's going to hit you with a sledgehammer, it's going to beat you to death. So I wound up that evening, they put me in the hospital because my leg swelled up. It was on Friday, and the nurses was trying to get the drain and swell it down, and they couldn't do it. So one come in with a doctor's name on her. It's about seven o'clock. She said, I got to call your doctor because we can't find out what's going on here. You ain't going to do that. They all live at the party. What are you doing? It's this Friday night. We don't go to them parties, you know. By 10 minutes, you come back and say, you're going to surgery tomorrow, it. Saturday. You don't do surgery on Saturday. You do it in surgery. They did my surgery, and about two, the next day they put me in the hospital, a nursing home right across from the hospital there to St. Charles. And I thought I'd acted it. They'd done the same thing that did this knee. Then they moved me over to rehabilitation, they call it, the nursing home. Stayed there 35 days. And I'm thinking they'd replace my knee. And I'm, uh, the doctor come in there, that's house doctor, and I was asked him that, this, if I went home, like I did this one, but he said, they didn't replace your knee. I what the hell am I doing here? So I told the guy I'm going home. He said, you can't go home. I said, you, we was outside walking, we went out in front, you know, uh, you see the guy blowed the horn at me a while ago? That's my neighbor. He'll come and get me. <laughs> he went in and told the doctor, hey, that guy's going home. You can't do that. So then he come in and see me. And he said, we're going to have him come in and have your wife come in for a meeting in the morning. Maybe I'll try to get you out. We had a table about half like this. And all, there must have been eight people sitting around it. And I walked in there and I said, uh, what the hell's all this? Well, we're going to, three of them is doctors that's supposed to tell me what the infection is. But I couldn't understand the word he said. You know, the two nurses that are, they were nice. Well, we got to do this before we get, before we can let you out. And I said, okay. So uh, when he got done with all of it, I said, you know what? All you boy, all you kept me in for 35 days for was the insurance. So I hope you made a good killing because you ain't done a damn thing for me and I left. Mm -hmm. And my knees hurt me ever since. And uh, I asked the surgeon, why, why didn't you replace my knee? And he said, well, the hospital, I said, the hospital, Hospital says they don't know nothing about it. And even the nurses that I've had for years says, I don't understand why he didn't replace your knee, especially after he did the same surgery on her saw. And he said, well, it's too much infection, but I ain't had that pick yet except arthritis. And I told him, I had arthritis for years, started cutting. You know, if you had that knee out there, I think it'd be better, but I don't know. But if it wasn't for my leg, I'd go dancing the night. I, I feel like good, you know. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I got my days, but if I just stop, I don't know how to get started. But as long as I'm lucky as I am, I'll still come over here and give these guys hell and, and uh, I don't know. Earl, you had him earlier. I, mm -hmm. I knew him for ever since he hired it. I, I knew his dad. His dad worked out here. I knew him. Now, have they mentioned uh, Brock to you about anything, Bill Brock? Bill Brock? No, yeah. is, he, is he around? Yeah, well, he was a BR a couple of times, and uh, him and Earl have run, up, run against each other for ever since they've been out here. 
And I think he wants to run for the directing BR this next election next year. Oh, so he's still employed. He's not retired. Uh, no, he not. No, his dad was with me in my first election. He came with me as a director in '81. No, '68 when I became BR '68. Mm -hmm. Lou Brock was the director of BR then, and with Bill Brock's dad. But he, uh, he, he lost, Gus Troyer beat him out the next election, and he's, about three or four years he died. But Bill Brock is still trying to get in, him and Earl is going to be bucking heads, I think, for directing BR. Huh. It's going to be funny as hell. Because I've, I've told Earl I'll support you as long as you run for office. And Brock, you know, he, he thinks I support him. I said, no, Brock, when, when your dad was BR, you was eight years old. I took you to the ball game down there with Lou Brock. He's a black ball player, mm -hmm. you know. And I had the picture made, me and you and your dad and, and Lou Brock, the ball player. And I asked him, which, which one you think is his dad? You know, <laughs> Lou Brock and Lou Brock, one black and one white. But uh, I don't know. Bill was over here with, with uh, Steve Dunn. His wife was a treasure. Bill was a BR. Their, their, their wives was real good. I knew both of them. One of them named Sidney and one Sandy. And I'd call one of them the wrong name, you know, because I was, then I run the whole show. We got rid of the gender. I, I was taking care of everything here. But uh, I don't know. Uh, international don't like Bill Brock. I know that. The one just knows him. So I don't know what's going to happen. And uh, I don't know if he might have been part of it. I don't know it cost her $300,000. The paper or some woman, it was a BR that well, he was supposed to cuss out or something or other. Mm. And that woman cussed me out more. It'll be, when I was a BR, it, any, any man could ever do. But she sued him, and why well, we paid him $300,000, I don't know. But he wants to be directing BR again. I don't know if he, I don't know what happened. He got there. I don't know. The international mm. might say, hell with him. We were just getting rid of all of us, mm -hmm. so I don't know. But when you hear his name, just let on like you don't. Who's that? I heard that name before. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Anything else? No, I guess not. Okay. You, you got yeah. everything's the BR and the president of the union. About Victoria Club, and uh, I don't know if anything else. Wait, you said president. You mean directing business rep? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. See, I, I became a BR in '68 first. Lou Brock was directing BR. Mm hmm And uh, Lou made Gene Sewell the assistant. And uh, but. Really, Brock doesn't mean for it as his assistant because he didn't really know what, what was going on. Brock didn't. Brock wasn't a union man, and uh, he just got there because nobody else wanted him. But uh, then when Gus got elected, then we were. I was his assistant, and we worked together on really what what we got started here now. And we added on uh, to the building, and we changed all this. Put all this year was uh, this down here was the, the finance of it, sectors and all. And upstairs where those girls are now is where we put those eight BRs. That was their office up there. Yeah. And now we only got three BRs and have me where. 
but but uh, if we ate it, we still had to eat again, like we had the membership. I don't know where they've been putting them, because the, the local lodges we put them all over next door in those rooms up there. Mm -hmm. And I, I was going to take it in my house because uh, I've got all the pictures of my first. Retired club, you know, when I first got it. And the, those young people would be old people now. <laughs> I got their pictures on the wall over there and all the younger guys that's under. And I got a lot of pictures in that wall that the girls of International that you would know, I'm sure. Marie Cardonia, do you ever know her? I met, I met Maria, yeah. And, uh, and I'm, there's one girl that was really nice, uh, just before that one of the elections, she was up to uh, Pax River, that, that their thing was up there, you know. And Rhee Cardonia was there, and she was there, I, I think she had two girls and two boys. Really a sweet lady. And I've got her picture with Marie there, and me in there, and uh, I had, well, most of the presidents have died and gone there up there, and all the directing guys that had their wives and all, I got them up there. And some of the young guys that's now that is up there, I got, I got the whole wall of just pictures of, of my retired group. And, uh, Buffett and Burger, he's been there two or three times. And the girl that now she's uh, an international girl, what's her name? Dora Cervantes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's yeah. GST? Yeah, she, I got her up there. Yeah. But that's, I, I liked quite a few of the international guys, but the guy that I really liked better as the international president was Corpus. And he wasn't there for long, maybe only four years, five years, thereabouts? Uh, no, he was there about eight years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, he he really got involved when he retired with Retired Club. Mm -hmm. He's, uh, how's he doing now? Do you know? Is I he still living? Is he still around? I, I believe he's still alive. Yeah, I think so. And I, but I think he's maybe got some issues with dementia or Alzheimer's. Yeah. Ooh. But we interviewed him. Oh, we, did you? we have like a five-hour interview with him that we did maybe four or five years ago. Yeah. So we have a good interview, good. thorough interview good. with him. Because he was he was a nice guy. Mm. Yeah. No, very much so. Did very you have you interviewed Glover? Gene Glover? No, I'm not sure he's still around though. No, no, he ain't. No, so no. we never, oh. we did not interview. Um, I've only been in this job for 11 years, oh. and so really the um, oral history project has really only happened since I've been here. Mm -hmm. So we, I, we, we have a few uh, interviews with older guys, Roy C. Miller being one of them, uh, not your favorite, I know. Uh, and a man named um, Frank Hidalgo, uh, who maybe was more of a regional guy and not a not a Grand Lodge guy. Who did you say his name was? Frank Hidalgo. Oh, Frank Hidalgo, yeah. Uh, but, we, but we interviewed Don Horton, who was GST for a while. I'm given, you know... Because Tom just retired a few years ago, and Robert Roach just retired a few years ago. So I'm giving them a little breathing room before I interview them. Mm -hmm. uh, but we had, and of course, Wimpusinger passed so quickly once they found out he was sick. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have an interview with him. Now, when uh, in the RC election I had mm -hmm. with the team at UAW, a lot of international people came in, mm -hmm. you know, about eight of them. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. What year was that? That was in, uh, would be in 72, maybe okay. in there. And what, tell me again what RC stands for so I can write it down. I keep forgetting. RC. Yeah, a, a different company. You dip a union. Trying to raid somebody. Okay, yeah. it was a raid. Right. Okay, okay. Yeah, raid. See, so team they, want to uh, raid IAM. And then when that happened, any union can put a card in. Mm-hmm. You know, like, uh, like I tried to organize uh, a lot of the non-union people at McDonald's. Notice when I was a BR. Mm-hmm. But then you get so many cards in, you you know this. Either one, other than one card can go in there. Now they change the labor board and all that. You can't just pick a one group. You got to pick the whole group. That's why the organizing is no good no more. Mm-hmm. It just it just it's hard to organize anything now. But uh. And we've interviewed a lot of, I'm sorry. I, I, I pertinent went to International be an International man and go south, work down New Orleans. You did? Yeah, but I said, well, I, don't, I ain't going to do that. You know, I thought I was, I thought I was happy in marriage. I thought everything was going to end. I wouldn't be, I, you live up, you live up on a suitcase if you work for the International. Mm-hmm. So they'd make a phone call and you're going somewhere else in the year. Well, I didn't want to do that. Well, they said, no, you don't have to worry about that. But I didn't go. But a lot of times I wished I had it, but the way things just happened, I think I was, I'm glad I stayed who I was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But they were a lot of nice guys came out of that south. That all, and I don't know how it worked out that they didn't want to associate with none of these other BRs, but they all thought Claude was either a jackass or something because uh, you know, they'd, they'd come out of my place with barbecue and everything else. But uh, I, I, I didn't know. I, they, were, they, were all, they were all nice, nice. Stuff. Gene Glover, well, I talk about Gene Glover, but uh, Jim Malott. He was an international man. You heard I've him? heard that name, but I believe he passed. You'd probably hear the bad name about him. He, he, uh, he got pretty bad, but the lady secretary filed him for, labor, for sexual harassment. Cost, was that at the Grand Lodge? Yeah. Cost us a couple of dollars to get his ass out of there. Mm. And he lost his job over it. That's too bad. But see, J- Jim Malott was in here with, with me when I formed my own dip, first negotiation with District 837. Mm-hmm. It was a nice guy, you know, I thought he was, but, but the, uh, I'm thinking he was in Texas then when this happened. I think he had to Texas somewhere out there. And what's his name again? Jim, James Malott. I'm sorry, the name is ringing a bell, but I, I can't place him. I'm thinking when they, uh, well, when he got into all that trouble, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that they laid him off or, or something because I didn't give him more about him. I'm so, there's nothing about him online. I'm sorry, yeah, I can't. But he, uh, he was here with me for about, Maybe, maybe four years. Mm-hmm. He might he might even be here for that second election. Because you know, the fact that he come in, he, he when when uh, he was really when uh, when we got rid of District Nine, see that we didn't have nobody. But that that RC election brought a lot of they call them international people, but all it was was shopsters somewhere else just come in to help in the election. And that's how they got to be, start to be it on the Grand Lodge. And he was one of them. And uh, uh, 
another guy was uh, that he made GBP and pointed his son-in-law. His son-in-law is still as a GLR now, but I don't know where he's at. But when I had that RC election, there were a lot of international people in there trying to save that IM edition away from team, you know. That's what it was. But uh, I hadn't seen none of them lately. Or I ain't saw them in a good while. But I don't think you'll interview anybody that would tell you much about the union thing is 837. We, we've been known for a lot of long time. But I hope it's quieting down. I hope they don't call us. You mentioned I, to the international people, they say, oh, that 837, you know, even District 9, they're, they're glad they got that 837. But uh, maybe we was a lot of radical nuts, I don't know. I know Roy C. Miller was one I said that, see, when then we was, uh, now they make good money, BR, too. But he wanted to set our salary at $1,000 a year, you know, for our wages. And I said, what, what do you, what, do you hate us or something other? We're all the same union. District 9 is making 12 5 Why didn't you start us at that? And he said, oh, you boys ain't nothing but a bunch of rebels. You know, mm -hmm. oh, I, I said, I'll tell you what you want to do. But what I did, I went out to plant to my members out there and go let them set our salary. Had an election on it. You know how much salary they wanted? Nothing. <laughs> no salary. No, they, we won the election to make a new district, but they didn't want to pay us. And C. Miller set us at 12 5 at, after I went there. In his retirement, Lou Brock was the director. You know, he did an invitation, you got to go to the president's retirement. Lou said, oh, I don't think we're going. I said, I don't know if he's going or not, but I'm going. And I went. And that's when I say Gene Glover had to be my friend because uh, I really showed my ass, I guess, up there. But when he got through talking, he wanted to know who had anything to say. I walk up on the stage, I got a few words to say. The first thing I'm going to say is what a no good rat you are. And use a lot more different language, you know, and all that. Well, the next thing I knew was about four cops on each shoulder. <laughs> but Gene Glover come in and said, he's with me, and they let me alone. But I've still been up or not. But, you know, I was... But he, he's a guy that I really wanted to get out of the union with when I first met him, you know. But uh, the mother guys told him. They, but he would retire right after that anyway. He didn't stay there very long. But he was, I never seen anybody run drunk than a dog. Mm. No. So, but it's, water on the bridge. But I, I, I told him, I'll show you what a rebel is. I did say those words, you know, that's what the cops got me. <laughs> well, it was worse. It was funny. Yeah. But 837 will probably be known for a long time. That, you know, that mm -hmm. we went through quite a bit. And I wish they'd still build an airplane like they was. Because they, they, they flew over here all the time, that F-4s. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. They run that, we run that airplane out more than they run their automobiles out now. But slow down. Slow down. Well, how long you lived? You've known George all your life, huh? I was in Texas for a few years. Oh, Texas for a mm -hmm. few years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
I guess I lived in Arkansas a while, California a while, and the rest of it in Missouri. Mm -hmm. California a little while, about four year maybe. But I had a brother stay out there in uh, California, but well, he died out there. And then my oldest son, he, he still, when he went out there, he told his brothers, I ain't coming back, and he ain't never really come back. He's still out there. Mm -hmm. Well, he's retired, I'm sure, now, because he's, uh, ooh, he's probably 72 or three years old. Because I was 17 when he was born, so he's pretty close to me, me and 91. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was born when I was in Germany. You didn't mention that you were in the service. Big pardon? You didn't mention that you were in the service. Yeah, I was in the Army. But it was 45. See, World War ended in 45. I was in Germany in 45. But okay. then I come out, I got out in 48. Okay. Yeah, I stayed in Germany three years. I was stationed in Munich, Germany, and, and had a lot of prisoners. I drove a truck and called prisoners. And Munich, Germany was tore all to pieces, blowed every building up in it. Now it's the most beautiful town over there. Mm -hmm. All the refuge comes from Munich. My stepdaughter, her husband, was stationed in, in uh, where I was, Munich. And they showed me pictures of that and I said, I stopped in Munich, Germany. And then I had a nephew who was there before he was there. And he showed me pictures of it. And I said, Well, when I left there, it, all those buildings blowed, blowed all to hell, you know. And the, the prisoners was, uh, some of them could tiny speak a little English, most of them couldn't. And, uh, I was in the army with a guy from Brooklyn, New York, and he made the MP. And he was in Germany with me, but he was an MP as a guard for us, you know. And he he's my guard sitting beside my truck. And I tell him, I said, now when we get up here, give one of them guys your rifle and we'll go up and have a couple of beers at the tavern and come back and get them. Oh, I can't do that. I said, where's he going? He blowed his house all to hell. He got where to go, you know. And I tell him guys that I, I did that a time to pick one of them. You be a guard till I come back for lunch, you know. And I said, because you ain't going nowhere. I'm not going somewhere. You blow it on my my house all day. And I met a lot of sad people over there, you know. But it was, you know, I, I told my the, the AMP. I said, what do you think of this your place? Why make you want to blow us up? You want to be treated different than anyone else, you know? But just because he's a German and a prisoner, you don't have to treat him bad. He's already been bad. And I was, I tried to be nice to him. But world is world, I don't know. So what else did he do? I don't, I don't know. Are you ready to wrap it up? What, whatever you think. Uh, I got all evenings. Well, I feel like we have covered your work. You, th you think you covered what you really want to know? Yeah. Just